Christ is risen. Easter greetings to all of you. Thank you all for joining this evening. Uh, what a fantastic treat it has been to just praise and worship and just be together after a whole year. And, uh, you know, also great to see our entire worship team up and our choir back up. And I just want to take a moment to appreciate um, everyone, especially the ones who have been toiling for the past year, bringing this worship service experience into our living rooms, you know, our, our SEAL team and our SWAT team, and, and also this evening for making this whole thing happen again to transition back, and, and, and also for our choir to bless us and our choir director. Can we just give a big round of applause to all of them? And I want to share a brief message this evening titled, Hope is Risen. And before I do that, I'd like us to join together in praying and seeking God to speak to our hearts. Would you please join with me in prayer? Dear God, we come before you once again, even as we sang songs of worship to adore you and thank you for what you did on this day that has changed history forever and has touched the lives of millions of people across the centuries, I pray that the same message of hope will come afresh to each one of us as it has been a very difficult year for all of us and we have all been afflicted in so many ways, Lord, and we need hope alive again. And I pray that this evening, you will make that true. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. And it really has been a very difficult year for all of us, isn't it? This once-in-a-century pandemic has unleashed a wave of sadness, loss, and loneliness that we have hitherto never experienced in our lives. And in doing that, it did not distinguish between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the developed and the developing nations. And yet, here we are today, almost a year of going into this, to look into a passage of Scripture and to zoom in on one person who got to see the risen Jesus first. And I want to draw some encouraging insights for us. You know, Easter Sunday begins with weeping and sadness for one person who dearly loved Jesus. You know, in John chapter 20, verse 11, we read that, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. You know, two times in this one verse, we hear the word weeping and wept. You know, this Easter, of all Easter's, is probably one of the saddest days for several people who have lost someone they loved all around the world and including our own church. Either someone in our own family or one of our dear friends have lost their father or mother or someone very precious and we have all gone through the grieving process together with them. And the loss is real. The pain is real. And there is nothing that can substitute that. And, and what is encouraging here is in God's Word we see someone who really loved Jesus and when he was dead, was going through the same grief and the same loss that you and I would go through. When someone that you love leaves us, there are only two questions that come to our mind. It doesn't matter at that point what religion you believe in, what philosophy you believe in. 
All of those things take a back seat, and there are only two questions that come to you, and you will only know this if you have gone through this. And the questions are, where are they now, and when will I see them? I remember asking this question at three significant moments in my life. First, when I lost my six-month-old nephew to brain tumor and held his cold, dead body in my arms. Until today, that's the most traumatic experience I've had. And I had to look at my sister in the eye and give her that news. And when she asked me, where is he now? It broke my heart. And a few years ago, I was with a friend who lost his nine-year-old daughter. And we dissolved her ashes in the Pacific and came back. And he asked me the exact same question. JP, where is my daughter now? Is she perhaps born in a wonderful family elsewhere in the Bay Area? And three years ago this month is when I lost my dearest brother-in-law suddenly, and I had the same questions that my wife and his wife were asking and struggling with. So this is real, my dear friends, and I know if you have lost someone this year, these are questions you are asking as well. And I'm speaking more from how this passage spoke to me and encouraged me. You know, the emptiness that they leave behind can only be quenched, not by some pep talk or inspirational words, but by real tangible hope that can only be found in Jesus Christ. You know, the incredible thing about Easter it's not that it is just a fact that amazes our minds. And there have been people who have investigated the facts and have gone into the archaeological evidences and eyewitness testimonies to prove that really he was the first person in the history of humanity to have overcome death and literally come back alive. As fascinating it is to our minds... It is more than an intellectual quest. It really encourages our hearts and gives us true hope. And that is what Easter is about. Easter is about the resurrection of Christ transcending from being a fascinating fact to a heartfelt experience that gives you and me real hope. And we can see that vividly in the passage that was read to us as it brings tremendous hope to Mary and it transformed her tears of sadness into hope and joy. Now a brief look at who this person is. All we hear is she's Mary Magdalene. That's usually how they talk about someone and from where they come. She comes from a small village town of Magdala on the eastern coast of the Sea of Galilee in Israel. There's only very little information about her. There's another gospel writer talks about it in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. He talks about how Jesus was going. He says, soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. You know, Mary Magdalene had a pretty messed up life. But she had been touched by Jesus. Seven spirits, you know, in contemporary terms, you can call this person as someone who had a multiple personality disorder. We know of schizophrenia where people have two personalities. Here is someone who had seven personalities operating in her. And when you have something like that, no one loves you. No one wants to be with you. No one wants to hang out with you. And there is no cure medically. And Jesus heals her and brings wholeness into her life. And no wonder you can see how much love she therefore has for him. And she accompanies Jesus wherever he goes, even to the cross. She and the other woman are right beside the cross, watching him bleed to death. You know, there is one of the most famous sculptures of Michelangelo is the Pieta. 
and it is housed in a room in the cathedral where you can see you're not allowed to access it. I had the opportunity to see it in person. I've heard great stories about it. It really is a heart-wrenching, melting experience to see Michelangelo sculpt that. You see in that sculpture, Nicodemus in the middle, he is just taking Jesus from the cross and Jesus is drooping in his lap and there is Mary, the mother of Jesus, to his left and Michelangelo captures the other woman right next to him and that's Mary Magdalene. That's how emotionally attached she was and she became to Jesus. But something amazing happens on this Easter morning. Three things happen to Mary on Easter morning. Her encounter with Jesus gives her a new faith through a spiritual resurrection. It gives her a new identity. It fills her emptiness through the resurrection of a new self-identity inside her. And this encounter unleashes a new life-giving mission for her, and it can do the same for all of us. We don't have to be drowned in our sadness and sorrow over the loss of someone we loved. God not only gives us hope, he radically is going to change our life and make our life count and to be meaningful. And that is the message I want to leave with us today. So firstly, encounter with the risen Christ gives us a new faith. You know, in verses 12 we read, And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, women, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. You see, Mary had seen and heard Jesus talk about this resurrection before. He had even seen him bring a person come alive from death, Lazarus' friend. But that could not translate into having a real expectation that Jesus was going to do what he said he was going to do. There was a dead zone in her faith. And so when she meets Jesus... Jesus gives life to the dead zone and gives her a new faith. Resurrection is not something that happened 2,000 years ago to Jesus on the cross. It is something that can happen to you and me when we have an encounter with this Jesus. He resurrects us from our dead zones. Her faith gets resurrected and comes to life. Perhaps some of us I've been living in this dead zone. And today Jesus wants to breathe life into that deadness in your life. You know, when we meet Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, we get resurrected. The Christian gospel is that we meet the resurrected Christ and he begins to resurrect us from our deadness. He begins to pump his own spiritual power and spiritual life into us, and it begins to replace those dead zones we have. You know, in our natural conditions and ability, we don't have faith to believe in something as extraordinary as this. But the real blessing of Easter comes when Jesus opens our eyes and helps us to see him. And that is what the Bible says in Ephesians. If you read the book of Ephesians, it says the same power that worked in raising Christ Jesus from the dead is the power that works in you and me to help our hearts to come alive and to place our faith in Jesus. We cannot manufacture that faith. We cannot forcibly convert anyone to have that faith. It is the power of God and the word for power that is used is dynamis from which comes the word dynamite. 
The same power that God used to raise Jesus is what he uses in your heart and my heart so these dead zones can be breathed with his life. My dear friends, I want to encourage you to examine your hearts and ask how real and true is your faith. What are the dead zones that you want life to be breathed into this Easter? You know, the encouraging thing is when we go through those difficult times, we very often think God has abandoned us. He has left us to our misery, but Jesus was right next to her. So she turns and looks at him and falsely thinks that he is the problem. Because he asks him, sir, if you took away my Jesus, you know, my love of my life, whom I adored, please give him back. And that's what we do. We think God is against us. God is somehow messing with us. When he takes our loved ones away, he doesn't care, he doesn't know, but that's not the reality. He is right with us when we suffer. Even when we don't see him, even when we don't talk to him, even when we talk back to him, he is still with us. And I want to encourage you, dear friends, if you have been living in a dead zone, please remember, Jesus has not abandoned you. The risen Christ is with you. And he is patiently waiting to breathe life into your life. Most of us, when we, our life goes through a tough time, we make God the will and he becomes the enemy. But God leads us through those times of death and grief to really breathe life into us and open our eyes to see who he really is. And that's why the Apostle Paul talks about it. It's, he says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And he says in Philippians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You know, the apostle Paul, one of the brightest minds, he said he wants to know not in an intellectual way, but in a heartwarming, experiential way. The power of this resurrection. Secondly, encounter with the risen Christ gives us a new identity. You see that it fills her emptiness through a new identity. You know, women in ancient Middle Eastern times did not have much social recognition anyways in the Jewish world. And on top of that, someone like Mary, who did not have a great past, was really at the bottom of the social ladder. But what is amazing about Easter is the very first appearance of resurrected Christ is shown to a woman like Mary Magdalene. And that's some, a trend you see throughout the Gospels. You know, the Gospel first comes to a teenage girl. Jesus' self-disclosure was to a Samaritan woman on the outside of a city. And now his very first appearance is to Mary. And what does Jesus tell her? not preaching a 40-minute sermon to Mary. There's just one word that Jesus says, and it's a very powerful word. The only word Jesus looks at Mary and says is he just calls her out, Mary. That changes everything for her. You may wonder what is in that one word. Jesus is telling Mary, I see you, Mary. I see you. I saw you when no one saw you in the past. I saw you when you were grieving and weeping. I was standing right beside you. 
And I see through you, and I want to tell you, Mary, I love you. I am all that you need. Only in me will you find complete acceptance and love. I am all you need, Mary. You see, we all want to feel loved and important and wanted. And so we go about doing many things to earn that love, to earn that respect, and to live for that. Some of us, we work hard so we can earn a name. You know, if we, if we live for our work, our work will name us. We'll get that recognition. We'll get our identity and our name from our work. If we live for relationships, trying to fit in with our peers, or wanting our friends to want only us and not others, or wanting our parents to give us their stamp of approval so we feel validated, those relationships will name us. If we live for children, if our children's success is our success and we derive a sense of satisfaction and joy from that, that will name us. But what happens when next year your review is not so great or one of your projects fails? What happens when your friends disagree with you or walk away from you? What happens when your marriages go through a tough and turbulent time and all marriages do? What happens when your children experience some failure in life or relationships? Then it's all gone. You know, the only person whose love for us will never change is Jesus. He sees you, he calls you, he saves you, he has given his life for you. He alone is all we need and should satisfy us. And what Mary is experiencing through that one word is a psychological resurrection inside her. Firstly, she experienced a spiritual resurrection, and now she is experiencing a psychological resurrection to see that Jesus is all she needs. You know, what does this resurrection mean? It means the things that we use to name us, the things from which we got our identity no longer have that kind of power over us. When we are able to fix our eyes on Jesus and get that acceptance from Him alone, because He doesn't want anything from you. Thirdly, the encounter with the risen Christ gives a new life-giving mission. Mary gets a new life mission from Jesus. Her past may not have been great. She didn't have all the accolades. She never went to the Ivy League schools. She was not the smartest kid in her school. She was not someone everybody looked up to and wanted their kids to be like her. In fact, it was the exact opposite of all of that. But now Jesus looks at Mary and says, I'm going to give you a radically new and a vital and a significant mission and you know what that mission is, Mary? You are going to be the one who is going to go and tend all those 12 disciples of mine with whom I spent three years with that I have come back alive just like we saw in that short movie where she barges into the door to tell all the disciples, He is not there. He is risen. Imagine that. She's going to be the news bearer of the message that changes history. Was not given to the great apostle Peter. Was not given to the beloved apostle John. It was not given to all those other disciples that went after Jesus. It's given to Mary Magdalene with a shadowy past and a shaky emotional life when she experiences spiritual resurrection and psychological resurrection, now she is experiencing a personal transformational resurrection with a new mission 
that's going to lift her up. He says, go tell my brothers what has happened. She now has a new meaning in life. She goes to them and says, I have seen the Lord. Now she has something to live for. You know, anything else we live for is going to burn up when the sun burns up. And the sun will burn up eventually everything. But only those things that we do for him and that we have received from him will last forever and ever and ever. It's only when we get this new life mission from Jesus of how to live our resurrected life in all areas of our life, in our marriage, in our work, in our money, in our friendships, that's the one that's going to last. That's the one that's significant. And that is what I want to encourage us with. We don't have to be bogged down in hopelessness. Maybe if we don't have that faith today, I want to encourage you to pray and ask God to give you that resurrection experience in your heart and say, God, I, I feel dead. I feel numb. I don't feel like I'm alive. Can you bring me alive, Jesus? And trust me, he will do that for you. And if you are tired and frustrated and have tried everything to pick yourself back up to move forward and you're just falling down again and again and are wondering if God even sees you, if he even cares about you, I want to encourage you this evening. He sees you. He sees you in your sadness. He sees you, sees you in your weakness. He sees you in your brokenness. And he's not against you. He is for you. And he loves you. And thirdly, if you are thinking, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I've tried to numb this pain with so many things, but it's not helping. I want to encourage you to pray and ask God to give you a new mission in your life that is bigger than you, that is not about you. It is life-giving that can be something you can do to others. And it can begin simply by sharing your experience with someone. You can be that first person to go and tell your brothers or your friends or someone in your extended family that death is not the end. And there is someone who has conquered death and overcome it and therefore you have hope. And you can say with Paul, oh death, where is your sting? And it can bring life and joy and hope to someone and that will bless your heart. And that is priceless. How much money can you pay for that? And that is my encouragement for us this evening, my friends. The prayer is that this resurrection will happen in our hearts, whoever we are, wherever we are, so we can have a new faith, a new identity, and a new mission.